questions come up. Hi, Marina. Thank you for joining us today to provide Spanish interpretation. Um, Absolutely. Charles is going to be joining us as well. Once I see him, I'll move him over. Um, I'm going to make the brief statement on how to participate from the Spanish channel. If you can then restate it in Spanish for me, and then I'll move you over and activate the Spanish channel. Sure. And is Charles a Spanish interpreter as well? Yes. So it's going to be simultaneous. Um, you guys will be handing off as you so feel the need sure. to. It's a two okay. it's about a two hour meeting. The chair is trying to honor the two hour timeline. Um, okay. We might run over lightly. Hope sure. fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available, and members of the public wishing to listen from the Spanish channel can join by clicking on the interpretation icon in your Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. <laughs> Once you have joined the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Marina, can you please restate that in Spanish? Sure. Uh, buenas noches. Para las personas que necesitan interpretación al español, uh, van a poder ver dentro de un momentito un globito en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. Háganle clic a, esa, a, esa, a ese globito que dice interpretación y ahí escojan español para poder escuchar uh, la reunión en español. Y pónganle mudo al audio original. Gracias. Okay. Thank you, Marina. I'm going to move you over to the Spanish channel with Charles, and you and Charles can swat, uh, switch roles as you feel needed after a certain amount of time. Um, I believe Charles can verse you on how best to switch roles as you feel the need. Um, okay, and <clears throat> so sorry, how do I communicate with Charles? Um, I will, do you have email available? I can email that information to you. Yes. Okay, I'll shoot you an email offline. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie or Dina, are we uh, waiting for a quorum? Um, I believe we have a quorum. I don't see Chair Cisco on though. Okay. There is a member on the attendee side with their hand raised with a phone number ending in 7134. If you are a member of the chair or of the committee, if you can please rename yourself accordingly or make sure you're logged into your Zoom city account so you can come in on the panelist side of the meeting. We cannot promote you based solely on a phone number for security purposes. Thank you. 
Yeah, for some reason, Dina, the link that you sent out in Outlook takes you as a participant. That was the first link I clicked on. So I had to go and look at the email from today. Um, Stephanie and Dina, I just got a text from Patty saying that someone needs to let her in. Um, she She's saying, I'm not showing it as started. Should I send her another link? Well, we were looking, I'm wondering if that's her with her hand raised. That's not, so, her, that's not her cell number because I checked. Oh, that's Jasmine is yeah. like three women. Jasmine needs, yeah, she needs to so get in. We need to promote her. Um, so uh, should I tell her to go to the city website and log in that way? One moment. I'm forwarding Patty the um, Zoom link. Okay, thanks. Stephanie, did you get that, that the 707-318 phone number is Jasmine? I, yes, she's okay. calling in and we can't, I just tried to promote her to a panelist, but I don't think we can do it with just a phone number. Okay. Can people still participate with raising the hand or how does that work? Um, yes, she can. I uh, the. Chair Cisco can see who's raising her hand. I'm asking Jasmine. Jasmine, if you can hear me, can you change your name so that we know that it's you? Even with calling in, you should be able to, let me see, maybe I can rename you. Jasmine. Okay. So I've um, I just resent the Zoom link to uh, Chair Cisco, and I am enabling Jasmine's uh, permissions to speak. She will not be viewed um, as she's participating via dial-in. Right. And she won't be shown as a panelist. She'll be shown as an attendee. Hey, Stephanie, I'm in. Can you? Oh, hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> are we ready to start? We are. Just so you know, um, Patty, Jasmine is participating via uh, phone. Okay. Um, you can see her on the attendee side. Right now, she has her hand raised. We've enabled her speaking permission so that she can participate in the meeting, but because she's calling in with the phone, we cannot promote her as a panelist. So, okay. So Jasmine, if there's a comments you want to say, you can raise your hand and um, Chair Cisco will keep an eye on that to make sure she calls you for any comments. So thank you so much. You I'm sorry. I was going to say thank you so much and I apologize. There's something wrong with the network here where I am. I assume it's because of the weather. So I'm only uh, able to call in, but I appreciate you all facilitating my participation today. No problem. And Chair Cisco, whenever you're ready um, to call the meeting to order and do roll call, we do have a quorum. Okay, great. Sorry about, I'm having technical difficulties with my other iPad having updated and <laughs> I don't know how to get it to work right. So anyway, okay. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and start um, and do the call to order and roll call, okay. please. Member Adizong. Member Barber. Here. Member Bartley. Scott, are you with us? I'll come back to him. Member Byrne. Present. 
Thank you. Member Condren? Here. Member Cunningham? Here. Member Diaz? Here. Member Gudino? Here. Thank you. Member Close? Member Ling? Brian Ling here. Thank you. Member Martinez? Present. Member Mazia? Here. Member Miller? Member Minor? Here. Member Oliveras? Member Pitts? Yes. Member Badenford? Here. Member Walsh? Here. Member Villalobos? Here. Member Weeks? Here. Let me go back. Member Bartley, have you joined us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Member Close, have you joined us? Member Miller, have you joined us? And Member Oliveras, have you joined us? And Chair Cisco? Uh, here. Thank you. Let the record show that all committee members are present with the exception of committee members Arizon, Close, Miller, and Oliveras. Um, Great. Correction, um, she, um, Jen Close is here. She's on the attendee side. Let me promote her to panelist. And I will mark her. As here. So the record Thank is you. the record has been amended to show that member close is is in the meeting and members Arizon, Miller and Oliveras are absent. Correction, Arizona is here, she's in the attendee. Thank you, Yvette, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank so, you, Yvette. <laughs> Okay, so now um, the record has been amended that member Miller and Oliveras are the only committee members absent at this time. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And um, just a, a reminder to the committee members, if you know for sure that you're going to miss a meeting, it, it's always helpful to um, email uh, or text me and or e email um, Stephanie so that we can keep track of, of uh, the comings and goings. Um, with that, let's go ahead and move to uh, public comments on non-agenda matters. Uh, this is a time when any member of the public uh, uh, can uh, make comment on items not listed on the agenda, but that are of concern to this particular committee. So I'll go ahead and open public comments. And um, if our host wouldn't mind seeing if we have anyone that's wanting to speak you if you're calling in by zoom you use the raise hand feature if you're using phone dial star nine sure cisco i'm not seeing any hands be raised via zoom okay great then i'll go ahead and close the com uh, public comment time and um with that, we will move on to item three, which is the approval of our minutes of our uh, November 17th, uh, 2021 regular meeting. Any comments or corrections to those minutes? And if not, then those will stand as printed. Next, uh, let's look at our December 1st uh, regular meeting minutes. Any comments or corrections to those minutes? And not seeing anybody raise their hand, I will have them stand uh, as printed. 
And we'll go ahead and move on to our schedule items. And our first item is uh, 4.1, um, another uh, presentation on our equity principles. And I believe Sue is gonna be taking that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Actually, we have, um, is Socorro Shields on? She will be uh, taking this on. So. Okay, great. Thank Hi everyone and good evening. Thank you for the time tonight. So I just, before I get into the presentation, I want to bring your attention to the attachments. The for attachment one is a draft version for you to be looking at draft only of what could be the charter review equity principles. It is basically just a small swap from the, um, redistricting committee principles, and we'll go through what those swaps are. I wanted to also share with you attachment two. This is a presentation that was made to the city council about equity priority areas in our city. And I just kind of wanted to bring that to everyone's attention so you could see the one, the ways in which council is thinking about it, and two, that they really are spread throughout the districts, that it isn't a concentration in one area, and there are larger concentrations in areas, but it is something that really all parts of the city need to be considering. And then attachment three is just a one pager of the definitions that the city is using with the work with SEED around diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. And so I wanted to give that to you as something you could reference uh, in the future. Now for the presentation. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go over, again, I was asked to kind of help walk through what is what were the equity principles in the ARC and show them to you so you understand that. And then in a separate part, it won't be part of this presentation, but as a separate item, I was also asked to address microaggressions and we'll get to that under that item as well. Next slide, please. So again, in the back of this presentation are the definitions of the of these slides and on that one pager. But I think as we go along, really thinking about how these are all related, but how they are actually different concepts that need to be, so the strategies to achieve them, while they may be similar, they will be different. Diversity, meaning having a broad group. Inclusion, meaning that people feel invited and, and welcome there. Belonging specifically, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, like a shared sense of ownership and power. And then equity, doing what's necessary to change conditions to ensure that we get to fair and just outcomes. Next slide, please. So, and you'll see this on the one pager as well, really conceptually think of belonging, especially for this group as you, you represent many different um, experiences, lived, um, lived experiences, experiences in government, experiences in, in everything. How do you both make people feel included, but also a sense of belonging. And one of the things you'll see is that belonging is like inclusion plus, it's a little bit more. In inclusion, everybody's there, but perhaps doesn't have the same power in the conversations, doesn't have the abil ability to mold and shape things as they're changing. And belonging really is about um, changing issues of hierarchy, whether real or perceived, making sure that it's flatter rather than vertical in terms of how people feel, and share and allowing different people, no matter what their position is, to change the way things are happening and allowing for those outcomes. Questions so far? No, I think we will go through and then we'll have questions. I think that's Yeah, what thank you. <laughs> Next slide. So the principles document itself, remember that it has an equity definition. This, your draft has the equity definition that the city of Santa Rosa uses. It has values that were 
deemed to be shared by that group. So those were transferred over, but they may look different for you. You may agree with them, may want to change them. The key starting principles, again, they were all just transferred over with some small vocabulary changes to make it more appropriate to the charter review process. You may agree or not in continuing them. And then norms, which you've identified earlier, probably have a pretty straightforward carryover about how the group will operate amongst one another. Next slide, please. So again, the, the norms that were identified and that I believe you'll be ac accepting as your own are about comments and questions, about transparency, about being humble, knowing that everybody's learning throughout this process, and about treating each other with kind and the community with kindness and respect. Next slide, please. So again, just to be very clear how your version of these principles is different, there are changes, they're highlighted so you know specifically what was changed. Every time there was commissioners on the old, it now says committee members. The city uses the concept of these equity priority communities versus communities of interest, which is a specific term for redistricting, but it's kind of the same spirit about how do you keep areas of need together? How do you identify them and what does that mean? And while this isn't um, something that's in this document, remember that the equity principles that are being kind of used as the, the starting point, identified equity as both the process and the outcome. So really thinking about for this group, what is your next North Star? How will you know that there is equity in the outcomes when you get there? Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Don't look at that slide. Go back. <laughs> that's for the next item. So that is, um, in a nutshell, your attachments and kind of a walkthrough of the principles um, now for your discussion. Great, thank you, Socorro. Um, any questions um, of Ms. Socorro? We'll go on to discuss it after uh, I take some public comment, but anything anybody wants to ask about right now? And I am not seeing anybody do that. So, okay. Um, so, uh, I'll, uh, public com comment on each item. So, I want to go ahead and call for the public on this item 4.1. Uh, again, if you are on Zoom and a member of the public, please use the raise hand feature. If you are calling in uh, by phone, please use star nine. And I will ask our host to let me know if there are anyone out there choosing to speak. Thank you, Chair Cisco. At this time, I do not see any hands being raised via Zoom for item 4.1 equity principles. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to bring it back to um, the committee now. Um, any, any points of discussion on? Uh, what we're working with so far. Uh, yeah, Jasmine. Thank you. And thank you for that um, great presentation, Ms. Shields. Um, I do have a few comments on the principles themselves and hopefully we can um, collaborate kind of to add a, more updates or um, maybe Ms. Shields has um, some suggestions. So. As far as the section on principles, I think the very first one speaks about um, just the community having access to the redistricting process. Um, and so, you know, obviously we, we need to change that to be charter review process. However, I think the priorities for the redistricting committee were, are very clear by looking at these principles, which is, um, you know, in the process, which includes engagement and um, then at the very end, right, the, the recommendations um, of their committee and now our committee, um, you know, it, it names ensuring that communities of interest are identified, um, right? So I think we need to, as a group, identify how the outcome of equity looks for us. 
um, in our work. And I think it, you know, for me, as I look at it, is is an access, right? Access to government, access to participation um, for communities historically excluded. Um, but I want to also hear what other committee members think, and maybe we can think about um, you know, what that outcome looks for us in, in terms of um, how equity is reflected in our final recommendations. Okay, thanks, Jasmine. Anybody have other thoughts on uh, what Jasmine is uh, speaking to or anything else? I would just, I, this is Jen, I did add kind of plus one to Jasmine's com comments. I think it's, it's really important that we um, decide what outcome looks like for us, specifically on, at, for the resident level, as well as the leadership level. Um, so what does that look like in terms of who we're choosing as leaders and appointing as leaders and electing as leaders and then also um, access um, for everyone. Okay. Just to add a question. Sorry, it looks like we have Scott first there, Patty. Okay. S Scott, do you want to go? Yeah, I, 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 Jasmine's comments, I think, were the things I caught that there was like in the first item redistricting process, you know, it's got to be changed. Um, a minor one, item seven, there's a missing period at the end of the sentence. I hate to be uh, picky, but, and then under, at the bottom, the, the, the equity comments, um, you know, equity in process, equity engagement, equity in charter recommendations, the charter recommendations, okay, the first ensuring the communities of interest, and I, I thought that wasn't the term we're using, or the city uses, so are identified, I understand that. The second one, I don't know what that, ensuring the communities of interest, and it just ends. <laughs> well, I I actually didn't replace those, thank you for bringing that okay. up, because I wanted you to chew on them, I just, they, they need to be, they need to be judged to be whatever you want it to be, but I don't know okay. what that is. Okay. And thank you for the corrections in one and seven. Okay, Logan. Thanks, Patty. Um, Socorro, I know that I know this isn't necessarily our, our specific scope, so I appreciate you doing this for us. Just kind of general questions. When is when is uh, this going to be a document that's used for other committees or introduced to them? When's that going to happen? So. What do you mean by that? Let me ask a little probing question. Uh, well, I was told last time we were the first city committee to see this. So I'm just, just curious, when is your timeline for making this something that every committee sees as part of a training or whatever the process is? I think we're having those discussions now. I mean, there's Socorro's world and then there's, you know, what everybody else thinks. So I, I mean, <laughs> ideally every, every committee would have these conversations and start with like now your version of what this is and, and tailor them to their work um, because they'll be similar but different in terms of their mission and what they're brought together to do. But it would be, you know, a goal that this would become a rolling document where it's starting to be refined by each group specifically to them. Okay. Um, and you've probably thought this. So I just, I just want to give sort of a comment that I think the redistricting commission was a good place to start from. But I think that's kind of a unique process. And we are similar to that and that we're only every 10 years. But I think for other uh, committees, um, fashioning it to be something that's used more often could be more useful. So I don't know if that may, means it needs to be more flexible or more detailed. Um, so again, and I'm not saying any specific critiques, so not, not asking you to rewrite it. It looks, it looks good. Um, just keep that in mind. That's all. Just a suggestion. Um, I'm on another committee and we deal with the public every month on, on a lot of different issues. So keeping that in mind. Um, but otherwise, thank you for putting it together, what you have so far. 
Certainly, and it could be like one through five. I'm just making up numbers. I'm not, but those might be consistent. And then maybe there are a couple that every committee like really choose on for themselves and comes to a shared understanding. But I think I think you're very right. Some things will will travel and some things will not. Uh, Karen. Uh, thank you, Patty. Um, I'm not sure who this is a question for, but um, how will um, the Community Engagement Division or CAB um, play a part in reaching out to the community to help us in this process, or will they? Sue, you might have an answer. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> how will uh, either the Community Engagement Division or CAB uh, help us in reaching out to the community to engage the community in this process? We're really working that out. Um, I had a brief conversation uh, with Magali Teyas, uh, director of the uh, community engagement um, just yesterday. Um, and so we're, we're working out what how community engagement can get involved and provide for opportunities um, for the public. Um, same, uh, same with CAB. Um, CAB can help us get word out, um, uh, but their role in the process is, going to, is, is, is still a little uh, undefined. Um, certainly welcome uh, suggestions or proposals um, but we will need to sit down with, um, with Magali and her team in terms of how can they best serve uh, the community in getting uh, engagement into this process. It's going to be difficult, and uh, I have to admit, to, you know, to have additional community, frequent additional community meetings out, uh, you know, out in different areas. Um, we're meeting every other week. Um, we are going to be moving pretty quickly. Um, we do want to get word out, and we're uh, uh, Chair Cisco and I um, brainstormed a little bit, and and uh, and uh, Rob Jackson of our office also brainstormed a little bit the other day about how to get word out about these meetings so that uh, folks that are in the community can participate here uh, when everyone's present. Everyone has this already on their calendar. When all of the information is being funneled through 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 these meetings, um, uh, you know whether we want to try to have any community meetings outside of this. Um, I think that's a that's a question that we have to work through and work through with um, with uh, with with the team. So. Jasmine. Thank you. Um, I'd like to propose um, a few uh, changes based on the conversations that we've had so far. Um, and then, you know, people can, we can either workshop them as in future meetings or, or now, um, if people have thoughts on them. So one is for number one, you know, change the, for under principles for number one, change redistricting process to charter review um, process. For number three, um, which is the other place where communities of interest appears, um, change that to the council language of equity priority communities. Um, and hopefully we can, if, if there's time at some point, maybe we can um, you know, have a definition of that uh, as the council sees it. But I think you did actually um, have a presentation on that. And then the last recommendation is for the section under equity charter equity and charter recommendations. Um, I have two proposals. One is um, increase access to government for historically disenfranchised communities. So that that can be uh, how our equity, how, how equity is reflected in our work. And then the second is um, that our recommendation enables leadership bodies to reflect the communities they serve. And that was just um, kind of a thought after um, member close spoke about you know including leadership in that too okay um scott you have something more to say yeah i i i think i think 
those comments are are well taken in terms of kind of focusing on our stuff. I have a broader um, comment on this this the document itself and and trying to apply it specifically to our committee. Um, you know, and I look at the the beginning statement, the values. Um, to me, it seems like we should be putting the norms after the values because that's basically sort of restating how we part how we behave as a body in our decision making process and then follow with the principles um because those are the things that we will be applying you know to everything we're looking at ideally and then to that point it's like those three boxes at the bottom i'm not quite sure what they do they sort of restate in bullet form, the principles um, in variations, but but there everything that's mentioned there is already mentioned up in principles, and I wonder if those are even really necessary. If we were to reorder it and and end with these are our principles that we're applying it. So that's just a thought. I don't want to. Um. Any other thoughts on um, what we do with this tonight? Um, I appreciate uh, Jasmine's uh, proposals as to the changes. Is that something we want to workshop tonight, or um, does anybody have any objection to? We're, we're get, this is going to be a continuing item so that we can keep sort of formulating um, this lens as we go. Um, so just kind of wondering what more you want to do with this tonight, um, and if you. Uh, if the committee members uh, have any disagreement with uh, staff bringing it back uh, with some of the proposed changes that have been made for us to continue our discussion uh, at our next meeting. Everybody, if you're not okay with that, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, good. Looks like we're we're in agreement with doing that. Wait, can I say, well, there's can I ask for one more to him? Can I think and I okay, think I'm, I'm not sure who that too. is. Could could you say who you are so I can tell who's this talking? Is, this is Jen, and I oh, think okay. Jen, we set her hand up too. But can we add physical ability to number one with respect to access and yeah, thanks. Okay. And, and then, this, is, this is Yvette. Okay. Um, um, I just want to, um, I like the document and I understand it's a working document, but, you know, for many people that don't like a whole lot of words and things like that, is it possible to maybe have maybe some circles and just, you know, high color, a little bit of color, because not everybody, you know, likes reading a whole lot of information. And so if there's maybe some pictures or something to make it simple so that when we're, if, we're, if I'm presenting this in the public, I can say they can see the picture and then they can identify with that. So that was the first thing. And I'm sorry, I don't know where to put this in, in the scope of things. Um, I did have a question about the agenda. I didn't get my microphone on um, fast enough, but for the roll call, there was a few people that was marked absent, but they was here. So I didn't know where to put this. I'm just bringing that to your attention at this time. I can answer that last question, Yvette. Um, I did a note that those folks who were on as attendee that I had amended the record to show them as um, in the meeting and not absent. So it, it doesn't have to be changed in the uh, absent portion. It's just because you notated it within. So I was able to change it in the absent. I was able to mark them present and they are not marked absent. So uh, this is for December 1st minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. It's, it's for December 1st minutes. I, I didn't know where to put it. So okay. let me just, and so there's a few, there's about four members that came in late, me, myself included, and you have us marked absent, but we was here. Okay. So that would be a correction in a minute. So if you were here, um, what you can do in the future is you can always email me um, before the meeting so I can correct the minutes. And then at the meeting, I'll send out revised minutes to the committee so that you are approving 
um, the revised uh, attendance minutes at the meeting or at the time that Yvette, just for process, at the time that you're approving the minutes and you see something at that time, you can um, let me know that there's a change that needs to be made. And then I will note that in my minutes for the current meeting and go back and correct the minutes from the previous meeting. Great, thanks for that. So just for clarification and for confirmation, I will go back, make these changes, pretty it up in terms of graphics and make it look a little um, sharper. You know, no, I think those are solid points that we want people to understand it from wherever they're coming from and whatever's gonna make it stick, that's what we wanna do. So certainly we'll do that and make those corrections. Um, throughout noting the language changes and then also the formatting changes per um, committee member Bartley's recommendations about the flow of the document. Okay, that sounds great, thank you. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and I think this is also yours, uh, Socorro, to move on to uh, 4.2, uh, the diversity, equity, uh, inclusion and belonging, the microaggressions um, discussion. Yes, uh, if we could bring back up the PowerPoint, please. There was a recommendation to kind of just go over what microaggressions are. And so there are two definitions for you today. That source on NPR asked, also has um, something to listen to if people uh, would like um, <clears throat> to refer back to. One of the things to know, I, just two things I wanna be clear. So microaggression is kind of, um, it, it's one of those, uh, it's a dig, right? It, it's, it's an unkind word to someone and it frequently happens over ism. So they can be related to, to racism, they can be related to sexism, homophobic um, microaggression. So it's not limited to race. We, we have been brought to our attention most recently in our community, issues of ra racial microaggressions. But they are those kind of comments that um, underneath them is the sense that there is a, a deficit or there is something wrong with someone. And so, you know, there, the, I believe one of the questions was uh, about kind of how do we know? And it's one of those things where you do have to be working because even if it's not intended to be a microaggression, it can be heard as a microaggression. So it is about working on one's own understanding of all of these and how we all travel differently through the world and being responsible for that. Next slide, please. The Harvard Business Review addressed this because it is something that can happen in the workplace. It is something that can happen out in community, right? So it, it is something that you as an individual who, uh, and that's you applies to all of us, must be working on in terms of understanding this work and how we interact with people. In addition to these definitions to help us understand, I was able to find and is in as an attachment some specific examples. Again, this is not exhaustive. It is just some examples that are out there in the world, but they can be as subtle as, um, do you need help writing that email, which you can be think um, is offering assistance, but it's also implying like someone else doesn't know how to write an email and, and needs your, I mean, right. So it's kind of understanding both sides of that communication and what they can lead to starting things with like, well, maybe you don't, and these are all personal examples. So I'm saying that these have happened. Like maybe you don't understand rather than maybe we disagree. Maybe you don't understand where someone kind of suggests that it's be something wrong with the person they're talking to, or you seem very emotional, you seem very passionate about this. That's on there too. Again, that kind of having feelings about some of these issues is inappropriate. I'd refer people back to the chart and think about things that way. And again, because communication is two way, it is also about checking in with the people that you're in communication with and having open channels. So if someone does feel that something was, um, something landed with some concern that there is space to talk about it and resolve the issue. Questions? 
questions? Not really. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, uh, committee members on this item? Not seeing any right now. So again, um, we allow the public to, to speak on each item. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call for public comment. If you're uh, joining us by Zoom, use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in by phone, please use star nine. And I'm gonna ask the host to let me know if there are any speakers waiting. Thank you, Chair Cisco. At this time, I'm seeing no hands be raised via Zoom. Great, thank you. So with that, I'll bring it back to the committee. Any discussion on this item? Yeah, Karen. Um, I just wanna thank Socorro for the, um, the chart, the example from, I think it's the University of Minnesota. It was, it was very helpful. Um, and uh, I hope that if, um, that you will, Catch me if I say something that I should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Socorro. Um, definitely appreciate, appreciate what you're doing here. Um, Okay, so with that, um, we're gonna move on to uh, 4.3, uh, which is the nature of charter amendments and review of past charter review ballot measures, uh, which is something that the committee had asked for. Um, and I believe Sue will be doing that presentation. Maybe Rob. Um, I'll be doing it uh, today and you'll be hearing from Rob in future meetings, so. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so yes, the, the committee um, asked for a little bit of uh, discussion of the difference between the charter. Um, let me see if this is the right, uh, may I see the next slide? Um, hoping that we have the right uh, version. We'll start in and we'll see. Um, the uh, okay, so let me let me go back to the title page. Sorry, that got me distracted because it was not the same as the version that I have. So um, anyway, the, the as um, uh, as Chair Cisco mentioned, um, there was some interest in hearing a little bit more about the difference between charter amendments um, and charter ordinances and uh, resolutions. So next page. So there are really three levels of action uh, within the city uh, regulatory framework. Um, and these are of lowering levels of formality and lowering levels of permanence. Um, city charter, that's city's constitution, next level down. Ordinances are the city's laws. So that's like the state of California's statutes. And the next line down is resolutions. And those are generally project specific, specific policies, specific procedures. We'll walk through each of those. Next slide. So we've, we've talked about this uh, quite a bit before. Um, the charter uh, is in effect the city's constitution. Um, it is the, uh, it's in general, it's the big picture. It's the big picture document. It's how do we govern ourselves? Um, it establishes uh, the general framework for city governance. It outlines the general organization and operation of the city. We've walked through some of those provisions before, identifying key personnel, identifying how the council operates, identifying how ordinances are adopted uh, and, and so forth. Um, the charter is the most permanent of the three types of actions. Um, it is enacted by a vote of the people and it requires a vote of the people to change. So what we put into the charter is not easily revised. It needs to be a ballot measure and then approved by uh, the voters. So again, the most permanent of the three levels. Next slide. 
And what's the process for amending the charter? This uh, does give a sense of what's all involved. Uh, the charter, uh, as you know, provides for the 10 year review um, done by the committee appointed by the council. That's this committee. Um, as you know, the committee is gonna research draft and recommend the ballot measures. And then if the council uh, will review those recommendations and determine uh, which, if any of the measures to place on the ballot for the voters, if the voters approve, that's when the charter is revised. Um, I also note here, and it's important, uh, that charter amendments can also be proposed uh, by voter, voter initiative. So um, this committee process is not the only avenue for amending the charter, but the voter initiative also requires voter approval uh, before it'll go into the charter itself. So next slide. The next level down is our city ordinances. Um, um, again, uh, it's our local law. It's essentially like a state statute, but just governing within the city. Um, and it ordinances, city ordinances really cover a wide variety of subjects. Um, it can establish details of the city governance. For example, our open government uh, ordinance that the council adopted last year and that goes into effect on January 1st. Um, and that ordinance really is related to efforts at equity and inclusion, large parts of that ordinance are. Um, an ordinance could also, um, in terms of city governance, could also establish the Police Citizen Oversight Commission that could provide for a police auditor among the list of um, essential um, city officials. Ordinances can also establish regulation of persons or property. Uh, again, a couple of examples. I'll tie this a little bit to some of the things that are on the list um, for the, this committee to consider. Uh, climate change, we have a number of city ordinances that um, are addressed towards climate change. We have an all, the all electric reach ordinance is probably a, a, a prime example. Um, the ordinance can also establish land use regulations, regulations of public behaviors. That would be things like our smoking ordinance, our noise ordinance. Uh, ordinance also can be used to establish city taxes. Ordinances um, are generally applicable. Um, they are not directed at one project or one person. Um, they apply throughout the city and they'll apply evenly. Of course, each ordinance may contain exceptions, have different regulations for different types of projects or, um, and, and, and these ordinances are often very detailed. Some of them are very short, a paragraph long, others are uh, pages long. So um, next slide. A violation of a city ordinance is enforceable by, by code enforcement and they act in the civil realm. So there are fines um, and, uh, and enforcement orders. Um, Many of the many, but not all of the city ordinances can also be enforced through criminal proceedings. Uh, many of our ordinances provide that a violation is uh, deemed a misdemeanor. So what's the process? Um, again, charter requires voter approval. City ordinances are enacted by a vote of the city council and they can be changed by a vote of the city council. No need to go to the public. Procedures for the adoption are established by state law and by local ordinance. It's normally a two-step process. At one meeting, the council introduces the ordinance. At least a week later, you have to wait at least a week, the council can then adopt the ordinance. And then the ordinances become effective. There's a 30-day delay before they become effective. They're 30 days after the final council approval, they'll become effective. Um, our ordinances, our ordin our, I'm sorry, our charter and also state law do allow for urgency ordinances. That's where an, er an ordinance is essential to protect public health, safety, or welfare. And that requires five affirmative votes to adopt an urgency ordinance. And uh, urgency ordinances go into effect immediately. Um, ordinances, I will mention before we move on to council resolutions, city ordinances can be challenged by the voters um, by referendum, and we have had that happen in the past. But absent a referendum, the city ordinances require just action by the city council. 
Next slide. So the third level down is council or council resolutions. And it's an action in general on a specific project or a specific policy. And it also um, has a, a, a variety of subjects. Um, it can provide a ruling on a specific project, um, just as the council last night uh, considered um, the uh, conditional use permit for a cannabis uh, facility on Spastical Road. Um, it can approve a particular contract. There were a number of contracts that were approved by resolution last night or decision on an application. Um, also, um, we adopted uh, shared mobility. One of the contracts that was before the council last night was a, a provision for shared mobility, um, shared scooters. Again, part of the climate change initiative. So climate change can be addressed at a number of different levels. A resolution can also establish new programs. We have a number of resolutions on homeless services, uh, including the Community Homeless Assistance Program, known as CHAP, and the Safe Social Distancing Site. Uh, resolution can also simply express council policy, declaration the recent declaration of racism as a public health crisis. Um, we had a couple of years ago, a declaration uh, regarding uh, protection of, uh, of uh, immigrants. Um, often there are proclamations in support of particular community groups that are doing uh, uh, critical and valued work. Um, declarations of emergency are also done by resolution. So resolutions really are very broad. Um, next slide. Resolutions are less formal. Um, they are not placed into the city code. They're not codified into the city code. Um, they may or may not have an enforcement mechanism. Um, and the council resolutions are adopted by city council um, by a majority vote, four votes. And they can be amended or rescinded or superseded uh, by the city council at any time. Resolutions go into effect immediately upon approval. So those are the three um, primary levels of city action. Of course, there are other things that happen at departmental levels, um, but this is at the council level and above. So any question about any of that layering, the charter, foundational document, the ordinances that are the city's laws and the resolutions, which are policy and project specific. Any questions about those items right now? Yes, hi. Hi, Sue. Yes, is that? Um, it's Chris. Uh, Chris. Yeah, okay, good. Thanks. I see. Yes. Um, thanks. Sorry. Um, very helpful. Very informative. Um, what I'm wondering is, as, as we go forward, what are the issues we should be sensitive to? It's not clear to me what sort of challenges a charter might be subject to and what level of detail in terms of the language we should be thinking of uh, for the charter uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much for that question. I, I, um, that has been for, forefront in my mind and I really should have included uh, that in a slide. What, um, what we should be sensitive, what the committee should be sensitive to is that the charter is a more permanent um, provision. It's difficult to adjust uh, quickly. Um, council ordinances, uh, ordinances um, are give uh, the city more flexibility to address changing circumstances. Council resolutions even more so, very flexible. They can, you know, they go into effect immediately. They can be uh, adopted very quickly. Um, but again, you'll want to think about, is this something that um, is kind of foundational to the city government? Is this, how much detail do you want to put uh, into the charter, which can only then be changed by a vote, by you know, the expense and time and effort of placing something on the ballot uh, to get voter approval. Is it something that's, that, that we recognize circumstances will change, that there may be new information that comes in? You know, some of the, the, some of the specific climate change provisions boy, we are learning and evolving so much right now. And we will be 
So we want to be careful not to put detailed climate change provisions into the charter because it will be very difficult to make any modifications that might become necessary. On the other hand, we may want to put, the committee may want to propose some general language that goes into the charter that kind of sets a general framework for how we are gonna address uh, climate change. As we talk about each of the topics, as we get into that, we'll talk a little bit more about what kind of language should go into the foundational document of the city, what things might be better left um, to uh, an ordinance that can be, that can evolve more easily over time, um, and what might even be done uh, readily by resolution and, and, and leave that to, uh, to council uh, to do. Um, so yes, um, the differences of these levels will become very important as you move forward and draft language. So. Can I ask a follow-up? That, that's helpful. So, Because it might help as we go forward with some of the discussions like uh, compensation of the council. Uh, I still like say, for example, San Francisco seems to have an incredibly detailed charter, just unbelievable. Um, and we don't want to set up some sort of legal minefield or some that's going to be subject to challenge. So I assume you'll be able to help us as we talk to guide us to say, where, where do we want detail? Where do you want kind of concepts or goals? Yes. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those issues uh, as we get into each topic exactly. Um, and I do recognize that there are provisions currently in the, in the charter that provide pretty, pretty significant level of detail. For example, the, um, the um, arbitration provisions, um, binding arbitration provisions, which have now been um, adopted once and 10 years later amended. Um, and uh, you know, that's a difficult, that's a difficult and um, process and can't happen very often. So, uh, but you are exactly right. Um, those will be interest, those will be important um, considerations and discussions as we head into um, the specific topics. Any other questions before? Sue continues. I had a few questions, Patty. Okay, go ahead, Logan. Thanks. Um, can, so the voter initiative charter amendment, so can that be done at any time by voters or is that only also on a 10 year cycle? No, that can be done anytime. Okay. Has that ever occurred in the city's history? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I don't know if any of the folks that have been around longer than I uh, are aware of any, but I'm not aware of any time that a charter amendment was done by, by initiative. Yeah, any, and I've been with the city for a while and in my tenure here, that hasn't happened. That's so not in living memory, past, we'll say that. Yeah. And not in the last 29 years. <laughs> I've been with the Thank city you. 29 years, so. <laughs> Thank you for your service to the city, Stephanie. Um, and is the process for doing that dictated by the state law? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. And for resolutions, can those also be placed onto the ballot for voters to approve? Is there any restriction on us doing that? Is there any history of that happening? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I'm not, that's an interesting question. I'm not aware of any way to uh, do a referendum on a resolution, but I, uh, I, I, I don't know a reason why it couldn't be done. I know there've been um, referendums on approval of major development projects, not here in Santa Rosa, but elsewhere. So. Um, you know, I, I can look into that. I just don't, I haven't experienced that. I have experienced referendums on ordinances. Um, not, not a referendum, maybe that is the right term, but it's actually passed by the voters. So the first time it becomes law is the vote of the people, a resolution. Is that possible? Uh, it, 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 mm, it is possible. It would be an initiative uh, filed by uh, voters. Um, the initiatives that I've seen have been in form of ordinance. Again, I, you know, maybe it's just my experience, but I have not seen a, 
um, an initiative that would just create a resolution. So I, I, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. But I'll, I'll confirm in a next week in our, or next, in two weeks, three weeks, when uh, we come back, I'll, I'll report back on that. I would, I'd appreciate some research on that. Just, uh, so I guess it would be the council putting it on the ballot, of course, because that's our process. Um, if we approved it, then the council would have to approve it. Right, on, in terms of yeah. a charter amendment. Yeah, so I guess my basic question would be, can a, resolu can a charter amendment be just a resolution? No, charter amendment will be incorporated into the charter. Okay. So this, okay. So, yeah, so. I see, okay. okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, and I, I'll also note, not to confuse the issue, um, our, our charter currently provides for the 10 year review of charter. Um, uh, the charter could be amended so that it could be amended more frequently. Um, we could go through this process more frequently, um, but currently it provides for the 10 years. Let's do it again next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think you're good to continue, Sue. Okay, great, thank you. Um, go, 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 try to keep, um, sensitive to the time. So I'm gonna to try to keep this um, next slide. Um, I'm gonna to try to keep this pretty quick. Um, the committee did ask for a quick review of the past ballot measures, um, the ballot measures that came out of prior uh, charter review committees. Um, uh, we've done a quick outline before, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. We'll walk through. And, and on these, um, I'm not gonna talk more about the um, what I've called the omnibus uh, bills. So measure L in two, 2002, which is combined charter, charter amendments, that's charter cleanup and measure T in 2012, again, the charter reorganization update and clarification. I'm not gonna go into those. So just the other more uh, single subject matters. Uh, next slide. Council compensation, um, this was, uh, there, there were three measures proposed in 2002, again, one omnibus, um, and then two single subject. Uh, one of the single subjects passed, one failed. This is the one that failed. It was measure M for council compensation. What's on the screen is the actual language that appeared on the ballot. It's not the ballot, the measure language, but what language was on the ballot. Next slide. Uh, it would have increased council member salary to monthly salary to 1500 and the mayor's salary to 2250. Uh, it provided for an annual cost of living adjustment in accordance with um, the COLAs that are given to exec city executive staff, um, although the cost of living adjustment was capped at CPI. And it would have provided for additional benefits, including retirement, health, eye and dental care, long-term disability and employee assistance program. And it failed, it failed uh, almost 40% uh, yes and uh, a little under 40% yes and a little over 60% for no. Next slide. Also in uh, 2002, um, this was the measure that did pass. Uh, it was measure O and it concerned campaign finance reform. Again, the language that's on this slide is the actual ballot language. What? Next slide. Um, this, this measure required the council uh, to, and I quote it here, consider and by ordinance enact new election campaign finance reform measures. So this is an example where the charter review committee um, uh, drafted and recommended that yes, there be something in the charter that provided for this campaign finance reform, but then referred it back to council for the details uh, to be enacted by ordinance. Uh, it provided that the measures um, were to include new limits on campaign contributions lower than $1,000 to limit independent expenditures to that same cap. Uh, it provided for a new schedule for reporting of campaign contributions for all council candidates and then it provided provisions uh, uh, for public financing of council election campaigns. And that, 
I'm sorry, my, I don't know why my, my computer's acting up, sorry there. Um, that passed um, with uh, a little over 60% uh, uh, voting yes, and a little under 40% voting no. So that one did pass. Next slide. Uh, three, uh, four measures in 2012, three of which passed. Um, this was uh, the one uh, that did not pass. This is uh, measure Q um, that would have provided uh, for district council elections. Again, this is the actual ballot language. It's on the screen. Uh, next slide. Uh, this would have moved the city from at-large council members, um, all council members elected by citywide vote, to district-based council members with all council members elected by district. It would have provided for the creation of seven council districts with district boundaries to be established by ordinance. Again, that reference of we're putting the framework in the charter, but the details in the ordinance. And then it would have set forth some criteria for establishment of district boundaries, and it failed. Um, yes votes a little over 40% and no votes a little over, a little under 60%. Um, when we talk about um, the at-large mayor proposal, um, we will talk also about how we got from the uh, failure of measure Q in 2012 um, to the fact that we do have district uh, elections now. And again, that was a result of some litigation that we, that we faced. Next slide. Measure R, 2012 also, um, this concerned binding arbitration. Um, as I mentioned, this was not the original adoption for binding arbitration for public safety employees, um, but this modified, uh, mod modified those provisions. Next slide. Uh, the uh, charter, the earlier charter uh, revision um, uh, was added to the charter by voters in 1995. Uh, the 2012 amendment added mandatory guidelines to be followed by the arbitrator in resolving disputes over wages, hours, and terms of working conditions. And among uh, other elements, it does require the arbit arbitrator to consider the city's financial ability to pay a proposed contract. Again, this is for police and fire. Uh, and uh, to determine the impacts on the interest and welfare of the public. And that passed uh, by a wide margin, uh, yes, a little over 72% and no, a uh, little under 30%. Next slide. Finally, also in 2012, Measure S, uh, which was to allow for design, build, procurement, and again, the ballot language. Next slide. Um, previously, the charter had required um, that all public works contracts uh, be awarded to the lowest bidder, certain exceptions built into that, but generally required all public works contracts uh, go to the lowest bidder. Um, and this added uh, a new charter section that would authorize, not require, but authorize the use of the design build uh, method of project delivery that en enables the city to contract with a single entity to design the project and then construct the project. Uh, and that also passed by a strong margin, 67% um, yes, and uh, almost 33% no. And that next slide, that is the, the list of the last two charter review um, uh, resulting ba ballot measures, again, absent the omnibus uh, measures. So any question on on those. Yeah, questions for Sue on these? Question? Um, this is Karen. I, I have a question. Okay, um, okay. And I should know this. Um, is the, are the charter revisions simple majority? Yes. Okay, thank you. And I heard somebody else. Uh, Chris. Question, Chris, yeah. Um, this might be for later in our discussions, but why did the um, uh, compensation measure fail so significantly? Um, I don't know. We'll, we, we've uh, been trying to get um, the, all the arguments for and kind of more of the um, campaign materials. And we've had a hard time. Um, many of the sites only go back uh, to I think it was 2004. We couldn't quite get back that far. 
but we are going to try to track that down. We will be continuing the discussion on compensation uh, onto our next meeting as well. So we're hoping to have a little more of that information um, uh, uh, at that meeting. Another question. I, I assume, I think you talked about this earlier. We're, we're probably going to uh, pass cleanup uh, resolution so that the city provides for district elections by charter, I would assume. Yes. But if that gets rejected, <laughs> then by ordinance, the ordinance then contradicts the charter, but I guess we'll just deal with that later. Yes, we're, we're, we're well aware of that risk. Um, and I, uh, you know, one of the options that we considered in 2018, and that I think we would consider again, uh, were it to fail at the ballot uh, box, would be to um, take a, a declaratory uh, action, seek de declaratory relief from the court, um, um, and, and and go that way. It'll also be interesting if we end up also putting on the ballot the direct elect mayor uh, provision. Uh, we will then have to make provisions for you know whichever one gets more votes uh, ends up um, becoming effective so it could be a very interesting scenario and and because of because the district elections failed um, previously um, my um, my recommendation is that we will keep that as a separate item still aware of the risk of voter fatigue with too many items. Um, but if we don't want to incorporate it into the omnibus uh, bill or omnibus measure, if, you know, and have other elements that are non-controversial cleanup matters fail uh, in, 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 if the voters uh, want to um, try to move back uh, to at-large elections. Thanks. I have Any one other... question, Patty. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Logan. Thanks. Um, Sue, can you just kind of briefly explain what I, what the omnibus ones were? Uh, and I just, I'm just asking just me, why couldn't we combine things? So why couldn't council compensation be combined with directly elected mayor, for example, into one item? Right. The the idea of and, and I and I borrow the term omnibus um, from uh, state from legislative uh, world um, up in Sacramento and in Washington, where cleanup items will all be grouped together. Um, the reason we don't want to um, combine um, significant single you know significant uh, issues is that you then have to have voters want both of them. Voters uh, might be very comfortable with council compensation, but not be favorable to an at-large mayor. And you and the and and the the measure could fail because there, you know, there's there are differences in in opinion on on both of them. So I think in general, for anything that's uh, could be controversial, better to keep it separate so that uh, it 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 stands or falls on its own accord. But there's no legal prohibition on combining items um, like that. Well, I'll have to look at it. There are single subject um, restrictions um, on ballot measures. Um, so, you know, are there ways to craft around that? Obviously, we, you know, omnibus um, measures do that. Um, I'll look more. Or we'll look more at what some of those limits are. Um, Thank you. Of combining. So. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions of Sue? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, um, I'm curious if other like cleanup matters as I think the term that you're using have already been identified um, that would be in addition to the district election by charter. Um, there have been some uh, identified by staff um, for, um, for some contracting uh, matters. Um, those are what I've heard thus far. I don't have them right in front of me right now, but um, I, I, I'll certainly bring those bring those to the group. So. Okay, appreciate it. And the, the other the other cleanup items that come to mind right now are that the charter includes some provisions that really are not um, not 
relevant. Um, so we have provisions about city schools. City does not have control over the city schools. Um, that is the school district. So we may wanna include that in the omnibus bill to delete that provision. There's a couple of others that um, are just outdated that we no longer have jurisdiction over that subject. So. And one comment, if we're doing omnibus, maybe we could have gender neutral language. Yes. It says he and she throw out. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, not seeing any other questions on this one. So we'll go ahead and um, open it to uh, public comment. Again, if you're a member of the public participating by Zoom and you wanna comment um, on this item, you can use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in, you can use star nine. And I'll ask our host to see if there are anyone waiting to make a public comment. Thank you, Chair. At this time, I see no hands being raised via Zoom for public comment on item 4.3. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, with that, then we're gonna go ahead and move on to um, our presentation on uh, 4.4, the council compensation. And um, as Sue indicated, um, I don't think that this is something that we're, we're not gonna get through this tonight with our complete mm -hmm. discussion. You know, my goal would be that we uh, get, get the information, um, start our, our questions, our thought process. Uh, we might begin the discussion, but I think that this is, these, are, these are meaty items. And I think um, that what may happen is as we, uh, we get the presentation and we, we have our break between uh, meetings, other questions um, may come up and, and then we can have a final discussion when we've, we've kind of had some time to think through these things. So uh, certainly we can start an initial discussion, but we will probably not be finishing it up uh, until uh, our next meeting. And just a reminder um, on these items, um, if, if you have questions that come up for you after this item or any item, um, please email your questions to both Rob and Sue um, in advance of the meeting. That way they, they can begin to prepare um, answers for us. And, you know, I mean, they're taking our questions away and, and saying which ones they need to come back with anyway, but that can just be an efficient thing is to, to get those questions out to them and they can begin to do the research to bring it back to us um, at the time of the meeting. So with that, um, let's do item 4.4, beginning on council compensation. Great, thank you. And, and I appreciate um, your, your comments. Um, this, is, this will be the beginning of this conversation. Um, we don't expect to, to get through it uh, all this evening, um, but, but we can at least start. So um, next slide. I'm gonna just jump right into it. So where are we now? Um, so currently the charter provides uh, that council compensation will be de determined in accordance with state law. Uh, the state law is uh, government code uh, 36516 for those that are interested. Um, and uh, the charter does provide that the mayor will receive 150% of the council member salary. So they, the mayor gets what the council member gets plus half again as much. Um, state law, um, again, the government code 36516 sets forth a schedule uh, of compensation based on city population and for the city of Santa Rosa, a population of about 180,000 now, we do fall into the category uh, listed there, the 150 to 250, uh, 250,000. State law provides for council member salary of $800 uh, dollars per month. That means under our charter, Council members are getting $800 per month and uh, uh, the, the mayor is getting uh, $1,200 a month. Uh, the state law does allow that the salary can be increased up to 5% per calendar year, but that increase has to be adopted by the city, uh, by the council, uh, by ordinance. Um, next slide. The 5% increase is not compounded. It's a simple flat rate of uh, $40 per month raise. Um, next, the $40 uh, accumulates uh, if it's not immediately applied. 
Um, and so uh, it accumulates um, from whenever the last adjustment of the salary to whenever the new adjustment uh, is. The Santa Rosa uh, Council compensation has not been adjusted for many years, uh, at least 10 years or more uh, since uh, 2010, uh, when the city's population uh, passed that threshold of 150,000. Um, next slide. So under current law, under our charter, which references state law, the council could adjust its salary uh, by $40 for monthly salary, by $40 for each of the last 10 years or so. Um, and that would be an, an increase of $480 in annual salary. Uh, this would result in a, one, a total one-time increase in monthly salary of $400, uh, resulting in a new monthly salary of $1,200, uh, an annual salary of 14,400. Uh, under state law, uh, the ordinances, uh, the adjustments can be made uh, only when at least one council member begins a new term. Uh, so since we do elections every other year, the adjustment could be made every other year. But again, council has not made any adjustments for about 10 years. So uh, it could be a, a large increase uh, at immediately and then uh, or at the next council uh, next November and then it could be adjusted every two years thereafter again by eighty dollars a month. Uh, under state law though the council cannot provide for automatic salary increases uh, so they couldn't say we're gonna we're gonna do this uh, large increase and we're gonna let it uh, increase by five percent each year thereafter. Has to be by affirmative ordinance. Next slide. All of that being said, the charter's provision that links the council's compensation to state law is not mandatory. This is an, an area of municipal affair and it is fully within the discretion of the city's voters. So the voters can set whatever council compensation they deem appropriate. Next slide. Um, excuse me. So it was tried, as we just talked about, it was tried 20 years ago in Measure M in 2002. Um, this is the language of the actual um, measure itself. Um, so that little paragraph in the middle of it is the entirety of the measure of the substantive language of the measure. Next slide. Uh, as we also talked about, it was rejected by the voters uh, in 2002. Uh, and as we talked about before, it would have increased the council salary to 1500 per month, and the mayor would have received 2250 per month. Uh, and it failed, as I mentioned earlier, about 60% 60 oppo 60 opposed and 40% in favor. So very, pretty strong rejection. Next slide. So where do we want to go? Where, 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 where do we want to end up? Um, so we'll look at a at first at some comparisons. So other California cities, um, these are, are ordered in order of population. Um, the list where the, where the mayor receives a salary above that by council members. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and if you look, it's a little hard to see on this chart, but if you um, can zoom in on your own computer or you have it printed out. Um, it really varies. Um, and, you know, for example, and then Fresno, uh, the mayor gets $5,000 more than a council member. Um, you know, whereas uh, in Oakland, the council, the mayor you know, gets more than twice as much as a council member. Um, high, high variation. Um, although if you look at where we are compared with, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to look at Oakland, but if you look at the two above us, Stockton and Modesto, and you look at the three that are below us, Hayward, Vallejo, and Berkeley, there's a huge variety, and we are considerably under uh, the other uh, salaries, both of council members and uh, um, very dramatically of, of the mayor as well. Um, once you get down to cities that are um, less under 100,000, so almost half our size, um, that's where you start to see 
uh, salaries more in line um, with ours, uh, but still we are among uh, among uh, the uh, some of the lower lower levels. At again, uh, annual nine thousand six hundred for the council members and fourteen thousand four hundred for the mayor. Next slide. And how about nationally? Uh, there was a national survey uh, done uh, last November, 55 different cities, and the average city, the average salary uh, among those uh, 55 cities uh, was uh, 36,477. So uh, considerably lower than our 9,000, was it 9,600? Um, this survey doesn't, though, include other benefits such as health insurance. Um, our council members do receive health insurance. Um, and when we come back next time, we'll also be bringing some samples of ballot of um, charter provisions in cities that have um, moved off of the um, uh, off of the state law provisions. So we'll bring some samples of that. Next slide. So why are we concerned uh, about uh, council compensation uh, and what do we want to address? Um, if the council compensation is too low, it does lead uh, to elected office being open only to those wealthy enough to afford it. For many years, most of our uh, council members were retired uh, or had uh, other sources of incomes. Um, and low compensation can also discourage potential candidates, particularly uh, in lower income or disadvantaged communities, just not able to afford to take the time uh, for, uh, for, for very uh, little money. Um, and then it can reduce candidate uh, diversity, uh, hourly workers, uh, single parents, lower income individuals, uh, and that means um, that we risk a less representative, a less accountable, less transparent government. And it can also create a higher risk of conflicts of interest. Um, uh, you know, uh, the temptation of, of um, both conflicts of interest in that people have to be working uh, in addition to serving on council. Uh, and so you can have conflicts of interest that way. And then also the potential for temptations for uh, um, for financial um, uh, conflicts. Next slide. Uh, but then what's the upper limit? Um, why do we have a cap? Um, uh, certainly there's an increase uh, on taxpayers. Um, there's, there can be a concern that an elected official will be motivated more, more by the money than by civic duty. Um, and, uh, um, and, and maybe the, the higher salary might not fully account for non-monetary benefits of an elected position. Um, overcompensation could also uh, affect budget, um, monies that are given, you know, that are directed to council salaries are not directed to other city programs. Um, it can also affect community perceptions. Um, so, you know, where do we end up? What level is appropriate? And this will be for, for, for this committee um, to discuss and, and decide. Um, that's a balancing act. We also will have to be considering what, what will be palatable uh, to the voters. Um, you know, I, I do think there are very, very strong arguments, uh, particularly for, for diversity, particularly for opening up opportunities for a broader range uh, of, um, of, of city residents, um, uh, so, so th that'll be important. Um, also we'll want to consider and be realistic about what the workload is for council members. And once I'm done with this presentation, I'll show you uh, the mayor sent over um, uh, his calendar uh, with uh, specifics redacted, but gives you a sense of what it is involved in being the mayor of, of the city of Santa Rosa. And indeed for council members, um, it's not just a Tuesday meeting, it's reading all of the materials in preparation for the Tuesday meeting, but it's also that every council member serves on, uh, I think at least two subcommittees, 
So there will be subcommittee meetings. Um, there will be materials that need to be read uh, for those. Uh, council members have obligations to attend uh, community events and community meetings. It, it, it's uh, it's a, a very uh, impressive, um, the, the work and effort and time that council members put in uh, 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 as uh, members of the council. So next slide. Um, we've had a suggestion um, from a committee member too, a question about uh, providing staff for council. Um, and this would be another means to assist council members um, in, in their service. Um, particularly would be beneficial for those who work other jobs or have young children. Um, a, count, a, a staff uh, could help with some of the more uh, routine matters that council, uh, council members need to address. Council members get you know, hundreds of emails uh, every day. So um, things like that, addressing particular constituent concerns. Uh, council you know, staff could be very helpful in that. Um, indeed, the county uh, supervisors, uh, each, each uh, supervisor, I think, has at least two, maybe three, three two, two and a half, three uh, staff um, that help them in their work. Um, the one thing to think about is maybe council provisions for council staff um, may be more appropriate for action by an ordinance or a resolution rather than a charter amendment. Um, it does have additional staff has um, significant, could have significant budgetary um, impacts. And do we want to put into the charter that, um, you know, that there have to be seven staff members for council members versus, um, you know, are there needs in other areas of the city where staffing uh, may be more appropriate, so or more needed. And next slide, that's, uh, that's it. And I'm happy to answer questions and then would invite discussions to begin. Um, questions. Uh, Patty, this is Karen um, again. Okay, and, thanks Karen. Uh, Chris has his hand up also, but uh, okay. I'll go first since I bet it in. Um, so I have two questions of Sue. Um, and the first one is, why hasn't the salary been raised by that percentage that it could be raised? Um, that's question number one. So I'll let you answer that if you know. Uh, yes. Um, it, it's really, I think for two reasons. Um, salary has been a concern to council members, um, but there hasn't been a high kind of awareness and you know it's not like right in the front of the mind that you could do this five percent it also seems like such a small amount uh, for any one year and politically it's very difficult to come forward and say um, we're going to now give ourselves a raise we're going to give ourselves a five percent raise um, it, it, it's just a difficult um, position to be in as an elected official. Um, so I think that's 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 really the combination. Um, there has been suggestions um, over the last couple of years uh, to start that process. Um, there have been suggestions uh, by some council members that they would be happy to introduce that uh, as they are on their way out so that it makes it clear to voters that they are not voting for this for their own benefit, but are voting for this for the benefit of the of the system of the community. Thank you. And then uh, my second question is on the list of cities that you had um, with the um, salary for the mayor and the council members, which of those are, you know, or maybe this could come back later, have a strong mayor system? Um, and then also which of those maybe have a directly elected Mayor, so that would be something for later on. Uh, yes, back, unless unless Rob knows off the top of his head, we'll bring that back. That certainly struck me as well. Uh, Oakland is one um, a direct elect mayor and very strong mayor. Um, so you know, I was not surprised that that salary was as high as it is. I was a little surprised, maybe, but um, that 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 makes some sense. Um, but we'll get back uh, and identify on this list. 
uh, which, if any, have direct elect mayors and which um, have a strong uh, mayor structure rather than a strong city manager structure. Chris? Thanks, yeah, Sue, very helpful. I have a few questions, so just blurt them out all at once. Um, first, the information about the other charter provisions would be helpful and informative, it seems, because I would imagine all those uh, compensation packages passed by vote, Right. And what did they do that we didn't <laughs> would be good to know. Um, and I'd also wonder what, is, what what's the number tethered to? Uh, generally, do they have a fixed compensation uh, adjusted by COLA or something, or is it general language and they leave it up to the uh, council? So that might be helpful. Um, and also I'm kind of wondering what the experiences of these other cities, you know, you, you, because your slide on the pros and the cons uh, raises very good points. And I'm just kind of wondering, we have a wealth of experience with other cities and, you know, what are they finding, you know, in terms of the candidates and public service and all of that sort of stuff. And I think with Karen's question, raise a great point that this other city slide is a great tool and maybe to add these other things to it as you go forward, then it gives us one graphic uh, to see some information would be very helpful. Thanks, very, very, very helpful. Thanks, Sue. And that's a very helpful suggestion. We'll, we will do that. So. Christine? Yeah, I just wanna say um, super informative, really appreciate the presentation and I have a couple questions. Um, the first question is on the, the slide that was about like the, um, the challenges if this amendment were to be passed. It said additional burden to taxpayers and so that made me think, is this, if we were to pass this, if this amendment were to pass, where exactly would this money come from that is, is increasing the salary of the council members? Uh, uh, and thank you for that question. Um, it would come from general fund uh, monies. Um, and it is a little interesting to me. These, these were the three bullets um, that are on this slide came out of a, a Stanford Law Review article. Um, I, I personally might question, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't result in a tax increase itself. Um, so it's, although it may trigger um, a, an additional tax measure, uh, what it really does is it takes money that's in the general fund and directs it to council members rather than to other programs or staff or initiatives. Um, so it would only increase the actual burden on uh, taxpayers uh, if, uh, if it was coupled with an additional, a new tax measure. So. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and then I guess my second question is, in reference to 2002, when um, this amendment did not pass, you uh, referred to like trying to find the campaign materials from that year. And I, you said you hadn't been able to find those campaign materials yet. But I'm curious, what does a campaign look like in order to support and make sure that these amendments do get passed? Right, there'll be a whole um, uh, effort at crafting a campaign um, and again, I think what, what needs to happen would be that there is a, a real effort to educate the public in terms of what do council members do? And I've almost forgotten to, to pull up um, the mayor's calendar. So we'll do that after this. Um, but what do council members do? Um, what is their time and resource commitment in, in, in undertaking this? The importance of the work that they do um, and then a real education about, we wanna open this up. We wanna make this available, not just to folks that have the financial means to in effect volunteer on a very substantial basis. Um, you know, the mayor, you'll see when we pull up the mayor's a schedule, being a mayor is, is, is virtually full time, um, you know, very close to full time. And this is, uh, and, and it goes for a couple of pages, you'll see, these are, you know, and I'm sorry, it's a little hard to, to, to see, it's very small, but these are, you know, council meetings, subcommittee meetings, uh, meetings of the, of the um, various public 
um, other public entities, meetings with constituents, um, uh, responsibilities with the League, uh, league of Cities. Um, uh, uh, the mayor is on the SMART board. The mayor is on a number of subcommittees. All council members are on subcommittees. Um, and if you, and, and they'll be meeting with staff on different issues and the next, you know, you can scroll down. This is, you know, that's a very common week for him. This is in addition to working a, 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 a separate job. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't count, you know, what's not on his calendar is the time of preparing for council meetings, preparing for the subcommittee meetings, preparing for the smart board, uh, reading all the materials for those. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily include all of the um, community uh, events that they're going to. So there's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very um, significant commitment that people make uh, uh, to be on council. And, and I will say just from a personal perspective, I, I very much admire um, uh, our, our council members and, and their willingness to, to do that. Totally, it can be um, on the campaign materials, we can pass out the mayor's calendar. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I was just curious. So is, it, is there a uh, like department within the city who is in charge of the campaign or I know we're no. not there at all yet. It's just yeah, but that's a, yeah, that's, no, that's a good question. Um, actually, because um, under uh, uh, state law provisions, um, the city cannot um, prepare, cannot use any city resources to advocate for or against any of these measures. Once it gets onto the ballot, there, there needs to be, there'll be a committee that, that, that forms uh, to pursue those, those efforts. Um, what the city can do is provide uh, informational item, uh, informational materials. Um, they have to be neutral. They can't be advocates advocacy pieces, um, that's the only thing. Um, we can do all the research, we can do all the drafting and we can provide information. But once the council decides to put on the ballot, we cannot um, use any city resources for advocacy. Um, but in preparing the materials, um, you know, the educational materials, that's where we can, we can um, uh, set out why, why we're even, uh, you know, uh, trying this? Why are we even exploring this? These are the reasons. And so I think as we start drafting, we want to, you know, the, I would encourage the committee to really think about what's the problem that we're trying to address? What, why is this a good for the community? So thank you for explaining that. Sue, so it's Jen. And we, that, that we can pay for polling, can't we? Just to interject. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can pay for polling. Yeah. Okay. That's what I, I just want to make sure that's right. Okay. Yeah. Annie. Um. Yeah. Thank you. I. I I've dealt with a lot, a couple of the city council members, so I know how tough this is. How much can they use to, to um. Do their campaign. I mean, are they paying more to actually win the council seat than they are in May in what they make a year? Uh, that can happen. Yes. And. Do people decline being the mayor because it doesn't work in their schedule? I can't imagine that there are a lot of jobs that allow that. Yes, there are. Um, I, I mean, I don't know anyone who has turned down the mayorship if nominated, but um, uh, folks will uh, ask not to be, um, will, will not pursue the opportunity to be mayor based on just the, the amount of time that that, that undertakes. Um, I also, know that we had, and, and um, city clerk can also verify this, we, we have had candidates withdraw um, because of the time commitment that's involved. I don't think we've had anyone withdraw specifically because of compensation levels, um, but I think compensation levels, people may just not even enter into the right. into campaign, but even at the last go around, we had someone who once uh, they found out you know, once they learned more about what was entailed, determined that that was beyond what they could do. And I do, um, during the nomination period, anybody who is interested in running, who wants to come in, even prior to coming in and pulling papers, but when they do come in and to pull the papers to run for council, 
Um, it's about an hour long appointment because I go over a lot of stuff with them. And I'm also very um, candid about the time commitment. Um, a lot of people don't understand that it goes well beyond the Tuesday uh, meeting and that, that the Tuesday meeting isn't from 4 to 9 p.m. Um, when I explain to them, they can start as early as noon. And like for last night's meeting, we went till 1230 a.m. And we started at 1.30. And sometimes there's a special meeting before that. So I'm very candid about the time commitment that's involved in letting them know that they do as a council member, not only are they a council member, but they are representatives on ad hoc committees, on subcommittees that the council forms and on regional committees like SCTA and climate protection and you know league meetings. So um, some of them will still take the papers, but then after um, the last um, election cycle, we did have a couple of people contact me and said they decided not to run after considering the commitment that would be required of them to be a good candidate uh, council member. Well, it makes sense because they have to totally give up a huge portion of their life mm -hmm. for very little compensation. They can't cut back on their... Yeah, I, I think this is huge for, for, for getting... Um, more diversity into city council. Logan? Yeah, totally agree with Annie's last point there. This is a big part of our DEI work, I think, is getting people uh, a more diverse city council. And I think that this will get us closer to that. Um, so some questions, Sue. Uh, Thank you to others for mentioning the strong versus weak mayor. So uh, I had that same thought. If you could get that information, I think it'd be helpful, Sue. Um, and then another thing I'm hoping you can get, if it's not too hard, is some of the uh, employee starting salaries at the city. And the reason I'm bringing that up is a resident had a suggestion to me. Uh, their suggestion was, hey, the council members basically the lowest paid administrative job at the city. So whatever, I don't know if that's an analyst or what the title is. Um, and their point was really more political, kind of what Christine's talking about is what's the amount gonna be? Um, you know, because we have this tension between politics and aspiration, what's realistic and what's aspirational. So what are voters gonna approve? How much money are voters gonna give city council members, right? And uh, I think that, we don't want to be too cynical, but we do need to think about that. We don't want to make it a large amount that's going to, you know, offend people or shock them, right? So I think that's hard, and it's hard to find that balance. So that's why I was kind of curious on those employee numbers. Um, I think that could be more politically salient to sort of have it be the same as some, you know, lower city staff. Um, just a thought, and I'd, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. I know we're running out of time, so maybe another meeting. But just one other point I want to make. The calendar is really important. I talked to the mayor about that. I did see a bike ride on there. So he's having some fun. But um, <laughs> we should really emphasize to people, this is a 24-7 job. And, you know, he could be buying milk at the store and someone wants to talk to him about a crosswalk for 20 minutes. So um, I think that we need to make that part of the, the message, too, is it's really a 24-7 job. So what do you pay someone that works, that never gets off work, basically? Um, so just a comment. And that was helpful. So thank you. Mark, how about you? Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cisco. So um, a, a couple of questions. Do any cities compensate um, council members based on a percentage of another agency's compensation, for, for instance, I thought in the past in the 90s that the Board of Supervisors tied their compensation to uh, municipal court judges, now you know state judges, and that helped a little bit. Um, if the council members, for instance, if the proposal was to compensate the city council at 60% or 50% of what the Board of Supervisors now get, um, it may, may help anchor in the mind of the public and say the council doesn't least 
in the city of our size, at least uh, half as much work, if not more than the board of supervisors. And then looking at the salary schedule, you know, we can get in this later, but the, the budget for the board of soups total um, staff, salaries, employee benefits in the counties class to top the budget is $4.7 million. And that's, you know, that they have three staff and five uh, each and five uh, board of soups and you're looking at you know, quite, quite a good number of people, and that's what benefits. But if there was an anchor that, that would work, that's just one possibility. Is it, is it legal for cities to do that, Sue? Do you know? And do other, yeah. cities, other cities do anything like that? Uh, yes. Um, I was reading some materials from the city of um, San Diego, um, and they tie it. I believe that they tie their council's uh, compensation also to, to judges. Um, not the full judge salary, but some percentage. I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, so yes, that uh, that that may be a possibility. And it'll be interesting as we look um, at the specific provisions. What other jurisdictions that you know are there others other than City of San Diego that that, that do that? So great, thank you, Yvette. Okay, um, so, so I'm in, in total agreement of um, the city council members um, definitely getting a pay increase. And so um, one of the issues we talked a little bit about it is the DEI in order to bring some diversity to council, you have to provide salaries where normal people can be a part of the council. And when it's, when it's not a considerable compensation, compensation living here in Sonoma County, it is difficult to be on this council, have a full-time job. And so they work really hard. So that's the first point. Um, second, uh, in relation to some of the other cities that have tied the um, incomes to judges and so forth, is there any way possible to look at how are they paying for that? Because here in our um, city, we have had a lot of budget issues in the past years. And so if we put this implementation um, forward, what would that look like for the citizens? What would that look like for um, the city council members? And the, I don't want to have something go forward and then, the, and then the next year it's like, we don't have the money. Something would have to be cut and it, won't, it probably won't be their salaries. It would be something else in the city that's probably important for the city as a whole. And then the, lastly, you talked about um, uh, people um, helping with the ballot measures. So is it possible to start if you can find any of those people that have participated in that and bring them into this meeting so that we can hear what does that look like, what does that entail, so that we can ask questions and you know about that process. And I think it's important for us to be educated in that portion. I was not around when they did that the first time. And so I would definitely like to hear more about that and pick their brain about what that would look like. So as we're making our decisions, we know that, oh, this is gonna be entailed in this process. And then uh, my last, oh, my last thing was for um, the mayor um, position, has anyone ever been mayor more than once? And then can they do back to back or they have to you know, be uh, spread out through the whole process of their term um, being on city council? On that, on that last question, um, and mayors cannot serve consecutive terms, but mayors can serve non-consecutive terms. So we have had a number of mayors that have served more than one term, but just not consecutive. And I see uh, former Mayor oh. uh, Bartley nodding his head. <laughs> Scott, you're up. Okay. Um, well, I've been there, done that. Um, I think uh, all the comments are valid. Um, I'm going to give my, my little spiel of history. I, I'm a businessman and I ran for council and fortunately I ran during a recession so I didn't have a lot of work to keep me busy. But the economy rebounded and I had to decide whether I was going to continue on city council or earn a living. Um, and I decided to earn a living. Um, it's easy to say, I think everybody here is talking about it. And it's great. Yeah, you know, we all know our council member and they deserve it. The problem is when people, the voters are out there, 
you're at, you're telling the voters, oh, politicians just want more money when we can't keep the potholes filled. And that's why it went down so drastically, failed so bad, is, you know, people's concern were potholes. And so it's a delicate dance and I don't have an answer to it. I know we've got to work our way to something because if we do, if we can't make this a little more equitable in some manner or form in terms of compensation, nothing is going to change. And I don't know what that number is. I mean, even when you look at that list of other cities, um, I mean, you know, it's got Napa, you know, seventeen to $18,000. That's, it's still not enough. If you've got a full-time job, you've got to want a motivation to really do it. Um, and, and I, you know, we're, we're never going to be in Oakland or even in Berkeley in terms of compensation. So I don't know. It's a discussion that I don't, I don't have the answer to yet. Um, and in terms of reaching out, uh, Chris, uh, Mazia, we need to talk to Dan Drummond because I'm going to make a strong bet that the Taxpayers Association came out in opposition to that um, in 2002. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more committee members uh, with their hands up. And so just again, in, in the interests of us trying to keep to our, our timetable, um, let's keep to questions um, so we can get all the questions on the table uh, and, and, and get ready to um, do our discussion next time. Um, I also have to do the public comment time. So, um, so with that, looks like Jen, you're up. Sorry. Oh, there I'm you sorry. are. <laughs> I, have a, I have a puppy here who's like 100 miles an hour right now and it's a little <laughs> distracting. I'm doing my best. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna do, can we as a group take, like, take a vote to, to authorize some polling? Like I, I feel like I don't wanna take some shot in the dark a, about a number, um, but would rather see what the voter tolerance is e exactly. Because Scott is exactly right. You know, We could raise it a little bit to where should people get some more money, but it doesn't, it's not enough to actually influence their decision or their ability to, to serve. The, this, this committee doesn't have um, a budget that would be sufficient enough for, uh, for polling, um, but we can, we, but I know that the council is interested in conducting polling, so. So just as a follow-up to that, Sue, cause I had that same question, um, at what point it would polling occur? And it so sounds like it's going to maybe occur after we've made a recommendation and then the council will decide, uh, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, what, at what point yeah. will we have the information about what the polling might be depending, you know, in, in either to inform our decision or to override it? <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, um, I, I, that's a very um, critical question. And I don't think that we wait for polling until we have everything drafted and over to council. At that point, okay. it's late um, in terms of um, the council would have to go out at that point, do polling and then decide which of the, which of the recommendations they put onto the ballot. Um, I think we will want, once we have a better formulation of what, what we're thinking of, um, and on a couple of different measures, I think that's the point at which uh, we would we would ask the council to consider some polling. So, okay, um, Lisa. Oh, thank you, Chair Cisco. I'll keep it quick. I'll have maybe some comments for the next meeting, but questions for today. I certainly agree with Committee Member Bartley that there's absolutely a political aspect that we will need to reckon with and have some strategy around. Uh, but there's also kind of a practical question about, you know, if a salary, um, then how do you think about that salary and how do you how do you decide that? What are the ingredients? What's the role of a council member? What's really our goal? What expertise and skills do we hope that they bring? What do they do? All of these ingredients, I, I think, um, as I've been thinking about this, it's so it, for me, it's a lot about what do we think the role of a council member is? and what is required. So if there is to be a practical tie and maybe this body doesn't 
particularly care to go down that road. And, and instead, I can see a scenario where it's you know tied to a portion of the Board of Supervisors, et cetera, as uh, Mr. Walsh mentioned. But if there's to be a practical tie, um, uh, for one thing, I know that there's about 40 hours a week missing off that mayor's calendar for sure. Constituent time, stakeholder engagement time, prep time, learning time, all kinds of things are missing there. Um, do we have a list of the actual regional boards and commissions, the city committees, ad hocs are a little bit difficult to get a handle on, but if it would help me if I could, if we could see just what are the base activities, uh, whether it's appointments to ABAG, uh, to SCTA, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I don't know if a list, a base list would help. Um, and then do we consider something like an estimate of constituent time and, and stakeholder time and, pre and prep time? So just kind of thinking about the practical aspects of what is the role, um, what, condition, what practical conditions are we trying to solve for, right? We're trying to open up the field to candidates uh, of all income backgrounds and all income levels and all, all types of, of jobs. Um, and so I, I, I really hope that we can think about the theory behind what are we trying to end up with? What's the role of a council member? What does that really look like? And how do we actually reach that goal of enabling people to run? Thanks. Um, Anna. Hi, so quick question. Um, based off what Mark mentioned earlier, um, do you have the ability um, to know the different pay or salaries for the county and the city employees or not, I'm sorry, council members, just because I think that's um, important to know. Uh, yes, we can, we can, uh, we can, we can, we can get that. So it's not a problem. And I'll also mention in response uh, on the subcommittees, the list of subcommittees and regional entities, uh, different board memberships, we'll certainly get that information for next uh, meeting as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Yvette, do you have another question? Okay, great. I'll be really quick. Um, so I was just thinking about the whole process. You know, we're talking about diversity and inclusion and how do we get the community involved with in community engagement. And I know we're putting a lot of work on our CAB not community engagement office, but one of the things that I have done with other in, um, situations here in the, our town is educating the public and not so much with polling and all that, but just educating the public about what it takes to be a mayor, what it takes to be on city council. And then, you know, maybe, I don't know, like, like how we have the conversations on race from CAP, maybe doing something in regards to the city council members and having that, that candid conversation of what it takes to be a city council member and then show the calendar, but then you do it as a presentation format and then you present that to the public so that they can get an idea that it's just not, oh, they're just sitting up there, you know, you know, saying yeah, yes and no, but really diving into the background of what it looks like to be a city council member. And then as we're working on this, you can have your community engagement office out in the public and then doing presentations to community groups and things of that nature. So that's just a way to get the information out there without actually polling people, but educating people about this process. Great. Um, Mark, did you have another question? Oh, I'm sorry, I failed to lower the hand. I'll okay. email the, the, uh, the uh, pay chart to us uh, through the... Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, we've gotten our initial questions out. I do need to take um, public comment um, and then I'll come back to the committee and, and give some more suggestions here. So um, with that, uh, I need to call for a public comment on this item. If you're coming in by Zoom, use your raise hand feature. If you're dialing in by phone, dial star nine and I'll ask our host to see if we have anyone wishing to speak. Thank you, Chair, we do. The first public comment will be from World Affairs County of Sonoma County. Okay.
Please go ahead and unmute your microphone and proceed with your comment. <clears throat> okay, what I had to say that was so important, you just missed it, but I will try and repeat it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I am a big fan of voting initiatives and referendums. And one of the things I would suggest is that you maybe reach out right now to these taxpayer advocate people to allow them a chance to give you their feedback on what you're thinking. So it's, it's kind of early on in the process, find out what are their issues, what are their concerns versus coming up with the plan and then giving it to them. That's my two cents and there you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chair, I don't see any additional hands via Zoom for public comment on item 4.4. Okay, great. Then I will close the public comment on item 4.4, bring it back to the committee. Um, and question for you, Sue, do you feel like you have clarity on the questions that you're gonna need to bring back to us? Anything you need clarification on? No, I, I, I think we have a good list of some additional materials to come, uh, to come back uh, with uh, for our next meeting. Um, and we'll also give uh, some additional thought and uh, encourage, and I know that the, the committee will be thinking about it and coming up with some, some ideas. We'll try to provide, again, what some other jurisdictions will do, have done, uh, so that maybe at the next meeting we can start uh, uh, having more discussion we've started today but you know how do we decide where the compensation will land how do we craft that how do we as is it tethered to, to another jurisdiction is it tethered to city um, employee salaries how is it determined so um yes i think we have the direction that that we need okay great so um Again, we've got a couple of weeks to let all of this percolate with the information that we have. And uh, you know, certainly the, the thoughts are already um, formulating. So uh, you know, enjoy that time <laughs> to consider <laughs> all this. And um, with that, let's go ahead and move on to um, committee chairs, city attorneys reports. Anything you have to report, Sue? Um, I was just going to mention a couple of quick things. Um, one is that we did uh, receive, and I think the committee members all received, um, a letter uh, regarding um, the potential for revisions to the referendum process. Um, we are looking into that, and we will be able to report back, or we'll try to report back at our next meeting if we're, if we're able to. Um, and then wanted to mention last at our last meeting, I suggested that we would be um, posting the agendas on Wednesdays. Uh, city clerk was gracious enough um, to not call me out at that meeting, um, but <laughs> words uh, that indeed we had published uh, that one agenda on Wednesday due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, but the, the clerk's office has taken up obviously the council meeting on Tuesdays. Wednesdays is publication of the council's final agenda. Thursdays is the publication of the council's preliminary agenda. So we're gonna be looking at publication uh, for this committee, um, most likely on Fridays. Uh, if we have the possibility to get that out on Thursdays, um, we will, um, but it's kind of the, the reality of where we are. And because of our meetings are so close in time, it would be difficult for us to move that up a week that would mean we would be meeting on Wednesday and we would have to have the agenda materials available two days later. So I apologize for that, but um, just the realities of, of workloads, um, we will generally be publishing on Fridays, Thursday afternoons or Fridays. Um, and then I thought I'd just let people know um, for now, I think um, the chair mentioned, we'll be looking at having at least two meetings per subject area. Um, we are starting obviously with council compensation. We'll be coming back um, next week um, with for further discussion on council compensation. Uh, not next week, next meeting. Um, we may uh, also try to begin the ranked choice voting um, discussion or at least introduction uh, to that at that same meeting. Um, we'll have to get a feel for how much time we have. Um, that will be our next um, topic and um, Diva Provo from uh, County uh, Registrar of Voters um, will be coming to speak to that. 
And then after that, we will focus um, next efforts on the direct elect mayor. And then from there, we'll, we'll, we'll go on from there. I know there's still quite a few topics to address after that. And, and then uh, just a quick question, Sue. Uh, I, I know these are being uh, recorded as, as we um, uh, do our work. What's the turnaround time for these recorded meetings to be posted to the website or, or wherever so that anyone who's missed a meeting or wants to check something out can get to it? What can they expect? And thank you for that reminder. And I'm gonna hand it over to um, our city clerk. Um, we try and get the video, uh, the recording of the meeting up the next day. The next uh, day. Yes. Yeah. So once the um, recording has been captured, um, the following tomorrow morning, I'll go and get the media file and attach it to the um, Legistar record, and then it renders and it should be up by mid-afternoon at the latest. So we, we try very hard by the next day to get everything up and running. And that'll be posted to our website or, or will it be captured on the legislative section of... Um... It's, it's posted, to, uh, it's published on the legislative section, but okay. on the committee's website is the link for to the legislative... Um, um, calendar. So if anybody goes to the Charter Review Committee at the top, there is a message. Here's the link to view uh, the meeting. Okay, great. Um, and a quick question, uh, Stephanie, do I need to be taking public comment on, on this item and on our, or not? On, on your committee report outs, yes, you should be taking. We, we do, okay, yes. okay, just to be sure. Um, okay, so with that, I will open the, the public comment um, time for anyone who wishes to speak on uh, our city attorney's reports. Again, if you're calling in um, by phone, it's star nine. If you're uh, on our Zoom, you use the raise hand feature and I will check with the host to see if anyone chooses to speak. Thank you, Chair Cisco. At this time, there are no hands raised via Zoom. Okay, great. Um, next item, we don't have any subcommittee reports. Uh, we don't have any written or electronic communications. So we'll move on to future agenda items, uh, part of which Sue has already told us, but do we need to go over that again? Our next, our next, um, meeting will definitely be taking up this, this discussion and potentially um, getting a presentation on the ranked choice voting. Is that, is that what you think we'll be able to start with or not? I'm, um, I'm a little concerned on, on timing um, and maybe kind of get a sense from the committee of um, we have a two hour block. It's, we it ends up not being quite two hours that we have for discussion. Um, but uh, is there a sense that uh, council compensation, we will have some additional materials to provide you um, and the discussion, um, is it the sense of the committee that that would take the bulk of that meeting? Yeah, so we would use that whole meeting for this discussion. I'm, I'm sensing from <laughs> what we've yeah. got so far that that's very true. Yeah, okay. and we've got a thumbs up on that idea. Okay, so that's our agenda item as Very well good. as the, the continued um, looking at our equity principles. Great. Great. Okay. Um, and again, uh, this does allow for public comment on this. Um, if you're a member of the public wishing to speak on our future agenda items matter, and you're calling in by Zoom, use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in by phone, use star nine. And I'll ask the host if anyone is waiting. There are no hands currently raised via Zoom on item eight, future agenda items. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, I think we can bring our meeting to a close. And uh, so I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting. Our next meeting is January 5th, is that correct? Yes. Okay, okay. And so 
happy holidays, everybody, and uh, appreciate your hard work here. And see you in the new year. Okay. And uh, you, Stephanie? Uh-oh, uh somebody was going to say something. Just thanks. Happy New Year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Great. Great. Um, Stephanie, before I leave the meeting, can I talk to you about um, a problem with uh, some email for one of our committee members, or should I just call you 